Today, we are going to be talking about the adult cardiac arrest algorithm. Okay? There's been some misnomers, but first what we're going to do is just go through the basics of adult cardiac arrest and how you are supposed to treat a patient when they code. All right? The first one that we address, according to ACLS or, the, um, or even our American Heart Association, is the circular algorithm. And it's the most basic algorithm. What it's telling you is it's breaking up into two minute cycles for your CPR. So you find your patient, you attach a monitor, you've started CPR. You should be doing CPR for two minutes before we do a rhythm check. While you are doing CPR, you won't be able to see any type of organized rhythm. What you are going to be seeing is what you are doing for your patient via chest compressions. So after two minutes, you stop, you check for a pulse, and you check what you have on your monitor, okay? At that time, if you should be shocking a patient, say they're in V-fib or pulseless VTAC, you should be defibrillating your patient, okay? At, that, at the full set of joules, it's like 150 to 200, okay? It used to be monophasic, now it's biphasic, all right? Then we go through another two minutes of CPR. At that point, after two minutes, you should be have, getting an IV established, bagging your patient, doing all the things that are appropriate for your patient. If we are at V-fib or v, pulses VTAC again, you should be defibrillating your patient. Then after that second subsequent shock, you should be looking at starting to give your patient some medications, your first line drug being epinephrine, one milligram, one to 10,000. And then it goes through a circular motion here every time. And it's every three to five minutes you're giving epi. If you're refractory to your V-fib, sorry, or pulseless VTAC, you should be thinking about amiodarone or lidocaine. Now this is just addressing here if you have a shockable rhythm. If you don't have a shockable rhythm, so say you are in PEA or pulseless electrical activity or asystole, then we will obviously be foregoing our shocks and you should be doing just your two minutes of CPR. And then during your second two minutes of CPR, thinking about giving your one milligram of epi, one to 10,000. And that's on your three to five minutes or every other cycle of CPR. So this gives you a circular motion to kind of just run through. But on this algorithm, it breaks it down more into this nice tree that you can follow, all right? So it gives you more of a step-by-step -step rather than reiterating every circular, circle around. We can start looking here. So if we start CPR, we find our patient, either you find your patient down or you have already made contact with your patient and they've gone pulseless for some reason. You start CPR right away once you feel for and don't feel a pulse, okay? You wanna attach your monitor, you wanna start bagging your patient if necessary or um, if it's you and one other person and maybe you can't um, have one person away from working hands, you can put a patient on 15 liters non-rebreather and they will get passive oxygenation with CPR. That's just something to, a little feather to put in your cap. So if we look at, after two minutes of CPR, we look at our monitor, we notice we have a shockable rhythm. We are going to follow this side of the algorithm just for that two minutes of CPR, okay? And it walks you through each step. If you have V-fib or pulses VTAC, you then shock Okay, and then you do CPR for two minutes because if you see it, you shock it, right? V-fib or pulseless VTAC, you wanna defibrillate immediately. So initial shock, one shock down. Then we do another two minutes of CPR. Doing, during that two minutes, again, you wanna drop an OPA, you wanna bag, you wanna start an IV, you wanna be doing all the things that you need for your patient, okay? Then we check for a pulse again. If it is shockable, we're going to follow on down this algorithm. You defibrillate your patient again, and then at that time you would give epinephrine, all right? And again, every three to five minutes. If you come to a shockable rhythm again, or your third shock, or your third defibrillation, you would shock your patient again. And then at this time you would consider giving amiodarone. Then we wanna start thinking about reversible causes, or your H's and T's, such as hypovolemia, hypoxia, hydrogen ions or acidosis, uh, hypo or hyperkalemia, hypothermia, okay? Then we wanna start looking at our T, such as tension pneumo, uh, cardiac tamponade, toxins, thrombosis, pulmonary or thrombosis, coronary, so start thinking of an MI, okay? Going back to the beginning, our patient has gone pulseless, stopped breathing, whatever is going on, we don't have a pulse. We start CPR, we do CPR for two minutes. If it is not a shockable rhythm, such as asystole or PEA, 
We go down here, and after two minutes of CPR, we then start giving the drug immediately. All right? We don't forego and wait those two shocks before we give a medication because we are not shocking or defibrillating this patient specifically. So you want to do two minutes of CPR fully, then get your IV, your IO, give your epinephrine, do that every three to five minutes, and continue those cycles. Again, if it's shockable, we're going to obviously move over here into the shockable rhythm. If it is still not shockable, then we continue. Two minutes of CPR, looking for our H's and T's or reversible causes. And then if we have no signs of ROSC, we're gonna just keep going through our algorithm every two minutes and every other cycle of CPR will give a medication because at that time it's about three to five minutes, okay? It's just a good rule of thumb to do every other cycle of CPR with your epinephrine so you're not overdosing or causing toxicity in your patient. If it is a shockable rhythm, you move over here and you follow the algorithm that way. One of the things that AHA and your ACLS guidelines are really harping on now is return of spontaneous circulation and taking care of your patient once you've gotten pulses back. Congratulations, you got pulses back. How do we treat our patient after that? And that goes with our immediate post cardiac arrest care, okay? If you have a return of spontaneous circulation right away, make sure you have a pulse, check your rhythm, and check a blood pressure right away. We want to make sure that our pulse is actually circulating appropriately or our patient has enough blood circulating and their pressure is good enough, right? Their heart's working the way that it should. Because for a minute there, it's a little sketchy. But now we're post cardiac arrest care, we've gotten pulses back, how do we take care of our patient? You want to get a blood pressure. If we are hypotensive or a blood pressure below 90, you want to try fluids because we want to see maybe it was hypovolemia, okay? Or maybe it was some other type of issue. So try fluids. Uh, you can stick to your 20 cc per kilogram bolus, but usually the general rule of thumb is one to two liters of, uh, of saline or lactated ringers, if you will. Also maintaining lung sounds to make sure we're not overloading our patient, okay? If that does not bring your patient's blood pressure up, then you wanna start looking at pressors. And it lists them over here at the side, such as epinephrine, dopamine, or even norepi. I don't know about in your region, but norepi is not common around here. That's more hospital. They have, usually have uh, infusions of epinephrine and dopamine pre-hospital. Um, it talks about also maintaining an oxygen saturation of 94%. If your patient's intubated, that should be done for you. If your patient was being bagged at the time and they are not able to maintain their airway still post-ROSC, continue to bag your patient or at that time, intubate your patient. Put them on end tidal CO2. End tidal CO2 is very important, okay? Then we come down here, you wanna do a 12 lead. You wanna make sure your patient didn't code in the first place because they are having a STEMI, okay? So we wanna make sure we get a 12 lead. If that's going on, then you wanna make sure you get your patient to the appropriate facility, all right? If they are not having a STEMI, then we wanna to check to see, are they able to follow commands? Ma'am, sir, are, can you hear me? Can you squeeze my hands? Can you wiggle your toes? If they are unable, then we talk about starting targeted temperature management. And that is maintaining a patient's temperature between 32 and 36 degrees Celsius, okay? What that's doing is just slowing the body processes down so while the body has a chance to come back to normalcy or homeostasis, if you will, that we are giving it a chance to slowly do that, okay? And that is a ma uh, maintenance of 24 hours, okay, at the 32 to 36. If they are able to follow commands, you either can extubate your patient if they can breathe on their own, or you can start thinking about giving your patient some medications to keep them down, if you will, all right? Um, and all of these, all of your uh, reversible causes are also listed because we want to make sure that we can treat something we can fix. So start going into that. Now, pre-hospital, obviously there are things that you can't check, but you can start thinking about it. Also pre-hospital, a lot of the students ask us how am I going to maintain targeted temperature? At that point, unless you are in a greatly outlying area, you're probably not going to be able to get them started on ice packs and things like that. So letting the hospital know that your patient was unable to follow commands is important because they can start thinking about putting their patient that is now theirs on targeted temperature management that between 32 and 36 degrees Celsius.